Well, a very good uh, Sunday morning to everybody here. The sun is shining brightly. I had to put my sunglasses on on the way to church today. It was a wonderful weekend. We had a lot of rain, thunder, lightning, something we don't get here that often. Something that I enjoy very much, so it's your know, nourishment for the earth. Now today is the uh, 25th Sunday after Pentecost. Of course, Pentecost being when the Holy Spirit came to the church. And um, not this coming Sunday, but the Sunday after will be the first Sunday of Advent. Let us go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Most Heavenly Father, God, we love you so much. Father, we have um, a heavy heart today, Lord, as somebody that we care about has come to be with you, Lord. They're no longer burdened by the flesh. Now they're free with you. Lord, as those of us that are left behind, help us, comfort us as we continue on in this world without them. Lord, not only is that the situation here, but throughout the world, people are having somebody in their life that has died. And Lord, we just... We just ask that um, each and every one of us here and all those that are that will be watching online, Lord, that they can be used as your instrument to share the love of your son, Jesus Christ, with all those that are around them. So that when these folks die as well, Lord, that they will be with your son, that they will be with you, Lord. May each one of us today and the rest of this week, may each one of us, Lord, have divine appointments so that we may witness to others about the peace that comes only through a relationship with you, through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask for the continued uh, blessings upon this church. Lord, we're thankful for all that you do. Lord God, we love you. We ask that as we go forward with this worship service, that the Holy Spirit flow freely, that, that we ourselves don't stand in front of the cross, that we ourselves don't get in the way of the Holy Spirit. Lord, help each one of us to rest in you and, and take comfort in the Spirit. Thank you. As always, we ask this in and through your sons. Nay, thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, join me in the collect of the day, which you will find uh, in your bulletin. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in your well beloved, in your well beloved Son the King of kings and the Lord of lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be freed and brought together under his most precious rule, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Okay, our first song is number 132, Power in the Blood. Thank you. 
Turn on the rest of the lights. We forgot the. Thank you. I noticed it was kind of dim, and then I didn't see the lights. <laughs> Thanks for turning them on. <laughs> uh, we have next on here uh, tithes and offerings. Are we um. Yeah, let me go ahead and do a prayer on that. Most heavenly Father God, we thank you again and again and again for everything that you do for us, Lord, for us and for uh, this place that we worship, that we worship you, Father. Lord, uh, it's just a, a wonderful thing to have um, a place to worship you, where, where many people can come, where we have plenty of seats, Lord, we ask that they be filled, that we have standing room only as we uh, come together each Sunday and worship you in fellowship and in community worship. Lord. Uh, Father, we thank you for all that we do have, both as a church collectively and as individuals. And uh, Lord, we know that everything that we have comes from you, including the air that we breathe. Lord, help each one of us to know how it is that you would have us give back to you. Put it on our hearts. Help us to understand and help us to do it um, joyfully and not do it because we think we need to do it. That we don't do it in a negative, selfish way but that we do it because we're willing to do it. Lord, put that on our hearts. We ask this in and through your son's precious name. Amen. Okay, so the uh, pastor's sermon today is on Mark 6, and he's going to be in uh, verses uh, 47 and 50 through 52. The title of the sermon is A Miracle of Jesus. Oh, my pastor is getting ready. Allow me to just open the Bible here to Mark 6, verses 47 to 52. 
When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. He saw them being battered as they rode, because the as they rode, because the wind was against them. Around three in the morning, he came towards them, walking on the sea, and wanted to pass by them. When he when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke with them and said, Have courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. They were completely astounded, because they had not understood about the loaves. Instead, their hearts were hardened. As uh, Heavenly Father, as uh, Pastor Michael delivers this sermon that you've put on his heart, Lord, help him to stand behind the cross and not stand in front of it. Lord, help each one of us here listening and all of those who will be watching online. Uh, open up our eyes and our hearts and our ears. Give us the discernment to understand these words, your word, and may the Holy Spirit move through it. Thank you, Father. We ask this in and through your sons. In his name, amen. Amen. Pastor. Well, good morning. Good morning. It looks almost like a spring day outside right now. There's so much sunlight, and it's actually not cold. Okay. You know, um, the, the hymn that was just sung, and may, many of the, the hymns in the hymn, all, even though they're old, they are loaded with scripture. And I challenge you sometime to grab an old hymn all, or look up one online, look up the song that we've sung here, or a different song. And actually study the lyrics and see what you can find in the Bible that matches that. There is a lot of scripture in those in those sermons. Uh, and that's something that, that or rather those those hymnals, the, 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 the hymns themselves. I kind of challenge you to look at that sometime. Now, we're going to see something in today's sermon that's going to may sound a little repetitive. But remember, in a society that was primarily oral, that is, not everybody had their own little set of scriptures, what we now have called a Bible, they had to memorize a great deal of God's Word. So if it's really important, it's generally repeated, whether it be a lesson or something that we are to know. For example, in Deuteronomy, we find where God repeatedly instructs to... Uh, to uh, uh, words of the Lord with all our heart and mind and soul, or something to that effect. It's repeated numerous times. Jesus will actually repeat it himself. And so the thing is, we need to keep that in mind, that if he's, if something is being repeated here, there may be a reason for it. So just think about the event we're going to talk about takes place after the feeding of the 5,000. Now, the crowd that Jesus, uh, that was there, the, the, the seed Jesus, that Jesus knew they intended to make him king after the miracle of feeding them. Remember, it was 5,000 men, plus we had women and children. And when you study the scriptures, you'll find out what, what actually happens in the synagogue, so that he actually separated the men from the women. That is, the women and children were in their own little groups, and the men are in theirs. In, but after the miracle that we have of feeding those people, they want to make him king. John 6, 15. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. It takes place after, shortly after, Jesus had learned of the death of his cousin, John the Baptist. The scriptures indicate that with urgency, at nightfall, the disciples went into their boat to go to Bethsaida. Now, King King Herod Philip named this town after the daughter of Emperor Augustus. So he's probably trying to cozy up to the emperor, has the authority to make him king or not, because the kings were not descendants of the kingly line of David, but they were actually just appointed by Rome. It is near Capernaum and the home base for the ministry of Jesus. Now Jesus went up to the mountainside after dismissing the crowd in order to pray. Only three times in the Gospel of Mark does Jesus withdraw to pray. One is in um, 135, where after a busy Sabbath in Capernaum, he, he goes out to pray in private. 
course, the incident we mentioned here, the feeding of the 5,000 in 646, and after the Last Supper, 14, 32 through 36. The verses today start with Jesus being alone. Now, the disciples' boat was a considerable distance from land. So one thing we see in the scriptures, we need to spend more time in them studying what they say and, and what is, and there's the obvious, and then there's the not so obvious. And that we can do anything through faith. Anything. So if you open your Bibles to Mark 6 46, we'll be looking at a miracle of Jesus. Now the first thing we're going to see is that Jesus can do miracles that defy our understanding. In other words, you're not going to be able to, to uh, explain them. They, they're, they're a miracle. That's why they're a miracle. You just can't explain them. And we don't need to explain them. We need to believe in them. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them. So we see that Jesus actually is walking faster on, the, on top of the water than they could row through it. Now, it was already late. The previous feeding of the 5,000 occurred late in the day to start with. And the Sea of Galilee is only about four miles across. This is about four times the width of Tomales Bay over in Marin County, a short distance from here. Being that small, one could see a boat in the middle, that is in the middle of the lake, with a full moon, probably with even a partial moon. And for the wind to be a problem, it indicates it was blowing from the north or northeast. Now, have you ever tried to ride a bicycle, or particularly one without gears on it, just a single speed bicycle, or paddle a canoe or rowboat in a strong headwind? It's really hard to go forward. The wind was so strong that they were not using their sail. So what we have here is a full-fledged storm, which frequently come out of the north. The boat was being tossed about. Now in the King James uh, Version, we read in Matthew 14, 24, But the ship is now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. So they are in a serious storm. And in this storm, it's being, the boat's being tossed about. Tossed about. Now we're going to see that this is the second time Jesus sent them out into a storm. The first time we read in Mark when that happened, he actually fell asleep in the stern of the boat. And as that boat was about to flounder, the disciples asked for help in bailing. And then to their amazement, Jesus stilled the waters and calmed the wind. In today's verses, we find that this happens between 3 and 6 a.m. in the morning. And this time, Jesus is not with them. But suddenly, he is walking on the water. Now, the Greek verb tense indicates the wind and waves did not hinder him. He was now about to pass by. Now, you show Jesus can do things no one else can when you turn to him for help with a miracle. When we are in crisis... We are not to be afraid of the means or miracles God may use to end the crisis. In other words, we're not to be afraid of the means. But as whatever God does, if it's a miracle, fine, we're not to be afraid of it. Sometimes these crises we are in are to prepare us for the future, or they're to teach us, or to teach others and how we handle them. The dust bowls of the Great Depression drove many ministers and pastors to the unsaved land of California, where they were to preach the gospel and establish churches. Every major disaster creates a witness opportunity as the Red Cross primarily uses volunteers for the Southern Baptist Disaster Relief Team for help. We are the manpower. This gives us a witness opportunity. How do you view a crisis, negatively or positively, for God's glory, which may not be right now? And as we move on to the next two verses, 49 and 50, we see that we are not to be in fear, as God can do a miracle at any time 
in addition to always being with us. So as a believer in Christ, God is with you at all times. He lives in you through the Holy Spirit deposited inside you, inside your soul, inside you. So he's always with you. But the thing is, we're not to be in fear because God can do a miracle if he so chooses. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. And the scriptures hundreds of times tell us, Do not be afraid. Maybe that's important. So Jesus is even saying, do not be afraid. Now, so they see him walking on the lake. Have you ever talked to an experienced fisherman? Not one that has all his sonic equipment and radars and stuff they now use, but somebody who just gets in his little rowboat and goes out on the same lake or same river to go, to go fishing. Whether they're on a lake or some other body of water, they know exactly where they are. And in that culture, it was common for sailors to be superstitious. So these fishermen, the disciples, know they're in the middle of the lake. They know they're in the storm. They know the boat's in trouble. And they're straining at the oars, and then they see what they think is a ghost or water spirit. Now, because it's common for sailors that time to be superstitious, they are really afraid. And the Greek word used here for ghost is what is the word that, that we translate into phantom in English. The disciples still do not understand his divinity. They don't understand he's God incarnate, God in human form. So when they see him, they are terrified. And then Jesus tries to put them at ease, as we've seen so many times in the past in Scripture, by saying, do not be afraid. And by identifying who he is. That is, he is who they thought they saw. Now your response will show if you fear God when he performs a miracle. So when God performs a miracle, if you're running away in fear, it kind of shows where you stand with your, your thoughts about God uh, and your relationship rather than being grateful for it. Now here Jesus identified himself uh, to the disciples in the boat as saying, or by saying, it is I. One could assert that Jesus was identifying as a divinity, much like God did to Moses at the burning bush. Exodus 3.14 God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So Jesus was trying to put the disciples at ease by showing they could put their faith in him. Now, after all, he was performing a not-so-minor miracle. He was walking on water. In the Gospel of Matthew, we get proof that Jesus was not walking on the shoreline. As many people say, oh, he was just walking on the shoreline, or he was just walking in uh, shallow water. Because we find, uh, we'll find the disciples identify that very clearly to where he was. Uh, Matthew 14, 28-31. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? So what happened to Peter? So first of all, we see here that he was walking on water, which means Jesus is walking on water, and that Peter's about to drown, which means it was deep water. So why? What happened to what happened to Peter there? Well, he was he was walking on the water at first. The answer is he took his eyes off of Jesus. He leaned on his own understanding. His own understanding is I can't walk on water. His own understanding is oh. The waves and wind are powerful. I'm going to drown. Rather than staying focused on Jesus, and when he was doing that, he was able to walk on the water. He leaned on his own understanding. Proverbs 3, 7. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Who do you lean on for help? 
How does your life work when you take your eyes off of Jesus? And then finally, we'll be looking here at verses 51 through 52. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. So the, we go back to the feeding of the 5,000 here. The disciples didn't understand about the feeding of the 5,000. This incident seems a repeat of the feeding of the 4,000. And the storm that followed, and the disciples not understanding them. Jesus most likely repeated the same lesson as they did not get it the first time. In regards to the feeding of the 4,000, Mark 4.39, He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still, the wind died down, it was complete calm. Mark 4.41, And they were terrified and asked one another, Who then is this? Even the wind and sea obey him. Then later, after the feeding of the 4,000 and after the feeding of the 5,000, in Mark 18, uh, Mark chapter 8, verses 16 through 21, they were discussing among themselves that they did not have any bread. Aware of this, he said to them, Why are you discussing that you do not have any bread? Don't you understand or comprehend? Is your heart hardened? Do you have eyes and not see? Do you have ears and not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of pieces of bread did you collect? That is, this would be the leftovers. Twelve, they told him. When I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of pieces of bread did you collect? Seven, they said, and he said to them, don't you understand yet? So back at this incident with them walking on water, he's telling them they've got hardened hearts and they don't understand. And the bread was being used as the means to try to bring them into understanding who he was. So once again, the disciples can see the wind die down with the presence of Jesus. This is the second time. As Jesus gets into the boat, we see the wind did die down, which amazed them again. And the disciples were in panic and amazement of Jesus walking on water and calming the wind. So we come back down to what did they fail to understand? One, Jesus was the Messiah. Two, the Messiah was not an earthly warrior king like David. And three, that the Messiah was God coming to us in the person of Jesus, that is God incarnate, God in human form. So we find here that the, that, the, the, the disciples have an attitude problem. They could not understand the supernatural power of Jesus. And in, and in these instances that we're referring to, it's feeding the 4,000, feeding the 5,000, twice calming the sea, and now walking on water, and they still don't get it. Now, a hardened heart refers to their minds being impenetrable. They could not perceive or understand what Jesus instructed or demonstrated with miracles. In the Greek language, a hardened heart also conveys or alludes to rebellion, not just ignorance. Think of it this way. If you ever witness to somebody who wants to argue about Scripture and is not or not interested in anything you have to say about Jesus, but you only have so much time to witness it to him, and there's others that may want to talk to you. They, they have an open mind, they want to learn. But if you're in prison ministry, you've got a very severe constraint of time. And you spend all your time with a woman with this hardened heart who wants to just debate. You're not going to reach the people who want to know about Jesus and want to be saved. And Jesus tells us, do not cast your pearls among the, among the hogs. In other words, you only have so much time to give the word to those who want to listen or are willing to listen. Now, this event that we have here should have given the disciples a very deep clue about the true nature of Jesus. But the Gospel of Mark does a very good job of revealing two constant sins of the disciples. 
What is the hardness of heart, which includes a lack of spiritual perception and an unwillingness to learn, in essence, denying God? And this revolts, and will result in a lack of spiritual perception, which in itself will be sin against the Holy Spirit. The second one is a smallness of faith. This is a failure to remember how God had worked in the past, and then applying that knowledge to the present. That's one of the beauties of the, of the Bible. It shows us eternal truths that apply at any point in society, at any point in time in our history, if we bother to apply it. There's nothing new. Israel at that point had seen many miracles of God, particularly during the Exodus and in the, in the conquest of Canaan. But with all those miracles, we have them suddenly not believing in Jesus, not believing in the miracles. Now, we know Peter had gotten out of the boat as he and Jesus could not get into it unless they were first out of it. Remember, the scripture said they, were, they got into the boat. The divinity of Jesus was shown again by the wind dying down when the two of them entered the boat. Matthew chapter 14, verses 31 through 32. And they, when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And as we go further in the scripture, we'll find that they walk away from that. They go back and forth, with, like with the wind. Now, you know the miracle of grace to enter heaven comes from knowing Jesus rather than just knowing about him. There's a difference. You can have head knowledge, study things, oh yeah, this is what books say, and then you actually know him, that is, have a relationship with him, and there is a difference. Jesus has told us he must know us, and we must know him for eternal life. Knowing him with faith and belief in him as our Lord and Savior is different than just knowing about him. Luke 16, 26 through 28. Then you will say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I don't know you or where you're from. Get away from me, all you workers of unrighteousness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth in that place when you see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. But yourselves are thrown out. So what we see in these verses is the number of miracles did are beyond our comprehension. We see some there, and there's this all over the scripture, all over the gospels. John 20, verses 30 through 31. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written down so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. And what we are given is a sampler plate of the numerous miracles he did, so that people would believe in him. By that is, there's a lot of them. John 21, 25. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have enough room for the books that could be written. So Jesus can do miracles that defy our understanding. We are not to be in fear of God, as he can do a miracle at any time, in addition to always being with us. And then finally, we are to have an intimate relationship with, with God, with Jesus, not just knowing about him in order to understand his miracles. How do you show you believe in God's miracles? If you've not prayed for the Holy Spirit to come into you, have not specifically turned your will in your life over to Jesus, and have not accept him as your Lord and Savior. This is the time to do it. Do not wait. Do it right now. May God bless you and have a, a wonderful Thanksgiving week. Thank you, Pastor Michael. Before we do our closing song, let's go ahead and do the announcements. Uh, we have a Bible study usually at uh, 9.30 on Sunday mornings. Uh, usually goes until 10.30.
And then, uh, right, well, right now we're in uh, First Peter chapter 3, just past, I think, verse 8. And on Wednesday nights, usually, we have a Bible study from 7 uh, to 8 p.m. What what book are you guys in? Judges. They're in, they're, they're in Judges. Not this one. Okay, so no no Bible study. Okay, so no Bible study this coming Wednesday, which is the day before Thanksgiving. But they're they're feeding. They're having a great banquet okay. on that day. At the Redwood Gospel. At, at the fairgrounds. At the fairgrounds. Huge. There is a huge uh, Thanksgiving and you meal. Can sign up at RGM. You can sign up at um, RGM. No, it's dot com. But dot up com Redwood, dot, yeah, just look up Redwood Gospel Missions. And under events, and you can sign up to help serve mm -hmm. or help with all kinds of things. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so if God's putting on your heart to, to help and out. And you can have me. At the uh, to help uh, feed or do things clean at the uh, fairgrounds here in uh, Sonoma County, Santa Rosa. In Santa Rosa, just not that far down Highway 12. The road here, it's right on uh, Highway 12. And then also, uh, you guys are leading worship at the Redwood Gospel mm -hmm. this yeah, on Wednesday. I don't know. Not, not, not that I know. Okay. That's what I was saying. Are you doing something at the Redwood Gospel? No, we're assisting. That's what we're doing. Assisting? At the fairgrounds. Fair 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 okay, fair not at the Gospel. Oh, at the Redwood Gospel. It's part of Redwood Gospel. It's part of the rest. Yeah, they do a lot of good work. They're actually on they're Facebook. They're giving out coats, haircuts, all kinds of things. Yeah, they're they're on, on Facebook at uh, just type in uh, Redwood Gospel Mission, yeah. and uh, you can see uh, they do a lot of uh, God's work. God uses them a lot to help a lot of people. So if you feel God calling you in that area, by all means, they if would. If you don't, just show up anyway, and God will put you to work. <laughs> Right, if you don't feel the call, just go there anyways and get something to eat, and I bet you God will use you. Oh. He does that. He has a way of using people. Sometimes without us even realizing it. Uh, and then, um, birthdays. We have uh, Ernst. His birthday is tomorrow. Uh, I'm not going to give away your age, but I know how old you are. I was surprised when I heard how old you were. I thought you were much younger. <laughs> I'm not gonna repeat that. <laughs> you're all you're image you're yeah. I I understand you have that as it seems as we grow older we feel younger. At least that's how it is for me. And when we're in Christ there's that wonderfulness feeling, that peaceful feeling that just gives us that younger outlook. So, um, Ernst, if you don't mind, we're going to sing you Happy Birthday. You have to only have to put up with it once a year. <laughs> and we're going to do the, uh, the Christian version of it, and I don't have the words printed out, but you guys, for the most part, know it. We thank God for you. We're glad that you were born. We celebrate your life and we bless your name in Christ. All happiness to you this day and all year through. God loves you, dear Ernst, and we do too. So happy birthday. I'm glad. I'm glad that you were born. Glad that you were born. Yay. Yeah. You know, everybody always says happy birthday, and it's like, no, oh, happy birthday, yeah, but I'm glad that you were born. Okay, so our um, closing song is number 333 in your hymnal, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms.
you know, no matter what life throws at us, sometimes it's hard and sometimes we don't even know it's been thrown at us. God is right there. And if you will just lean in on him, he will hold you tightly. He will hold you tightly sometimes when you don't even know that he's holding you. You know, which kind of takes you to that um, footprint in the sand of uh, home. You know, the person that uh, was walking saw two sets of footprints, and then when it got harder in their life, they only saw one set of footprints. <coughs> and Jesus says, that was when I was carrying you. And if you got really close to those footprints, you'd be able to see they were deeper. I'm going to forensic studies here. <laughs> But you weigh nothing. God can hold you without a problem. Okay, number three, three, three. people that are going to be driving uh, down the 101 today for the um, the 49ers game. It's the game starts at 105, so we pray for their safety. Uh, there's a lot going on in San Francisco. I believe at the ending of the APEC is going on there right now. Um, a lot of uh, protests going on down there. So for, for peace and safety for all people. God, we thank you for all that you do for us, Lord. We love you. We ask that you use us today, tomorrow, and the next day, that we may be instruments for you, that we may be used to bring others to that wonderful peace that comes only through a relationship with you, Father. God, we ask this in and through your son's precious name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Everybody have a good week. We have um, potluck. Oh, um, we can do the potluck prayer in there. Sure, yeah, we'll do. Okay, let's do the the prayer for the potluck. Um, Most heavenly Father, thank you so much for this food. Thank you for the provision of it. Thank you for those that thought to get it. Lord, we um, ask that it strengthen and nourish our bodies, that and that our bodies will process it well. We ask this in and through your son's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen.